I couldn't have asked for a better introduction than Dr. Morrison. He set up a lot of the things I'll talk about absolutely perfectly. It'll be a little anticlimactic after seeing all these 3D pictures of neurons to suffer for, with me a little bit, but uh, hopefully I can keep you entertained and do it with undergraduates. So, um, so uh, let me first start off by just uh, acknowledging all the people who helped make us do the work we have and all the people who have helped fund this work. Um, so my title for this talk was How Memory Works and How Can We Improve It? I'll actually not answer either of these questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have answers, but probably not the right ones. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, pretend that you'll come away. Actually, if you just think afterwards, boy, I learned how memory works and how we can improve it, then it doesn't matter whether I told you it or not, because that's what you'll remember. <laughs> so, uh, you could just retrieve that memory later on, think that, you'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the second thing is, unlike Cam, who has the soft uh, Australian pleasing accent, uh, uh, nobody ever mistakes me for being too quiet, uh, but they do just tell me I'm too fast. So uh, if I go too fast, just raise your hand and interrupt. It's really no problem. And likewise, also, please interrupt me with questions, too. Um, I'm fine to go through it if you go along. Um, oh, no. This is okay. So uh, in my lab, just to kind of give you a little bit of background, we actually have kind of three wings of the lab. It all started with basic science, just figuring out how, brain, how the brain works and how memory works in young, healthy undergraduates who are obviously not representative of the general population. Uh, but we moved on since then. It was somewhere after my midlife crisis that I started to decide that we should do something useful. <laughs> and so uh, we started to actually get deep, deep into the study of memory disorders. I have schizophrenia highlighted as one of these disorders because Dr. Carter basically introduced me to the fact that actually Although schizophrenia, you think of a beautiful mind and all this kind of stuff, it's uh, a lot of the problems in schizophrenia are fairly treatable by antipsychotic medicines, but the cognitive deficits and really memory problems stay. And the degree to which you have a memory problem determines whether you can live independently or go back to work. And the same can be said for a whole host of other disorders too. Memory problems really affect your entire sense of self and your ability to plan for the future, as well as your ability to remember the past. Um, and so I got tired of doing all this depressing stuff, showing how bad people were. <laughs> and so we've got some new lines of work that I want to tell you about where we're actually uh, talking about how we can essentially improve memory. Um, so uh, we use a lot of different methods in my lab. Uh, we use functional MRI, where we get pictures of brains activating. Uh, we actually do a lot more with it, as I'll show you. Um, but we also do studies of patients. Sometimes we study patients with selective brain damage, like this person who had a temporal lobectomy due to epilepsy. Um, uh, we use electroencephalography. This guy was the quarterback of the UC Davis football team who was also working in our lab, so student athlete. Um, we didn't go into his brain, but we also work with um, epileptologists who have to do surgeries to find the site of epileptic seizures. And when they stick electrodes in the brain to try to find those seizure foci, we can actually record activity directly from the human brain and measure activity over time and different frequencies. And so this is kind of the holy grail of human brain research is to really identify what's happening where and when and link it to behavior in a meaningful way. So we're really excited about that kind of work. And finally, we're doing some new work with brain stimulation. Um, Actually, I never wear a lab coat around the lab. That's just to look science-y for you guys. <laughs> um, but, or to wipe off goo if I'm putting electrode gel on my hands. Um, so why do we need to understand memory? I mean, obviously, many people, first thing they think of is Alzheimer's disease. And probably, I'm guessing almost everyone in this room knows someone who has Alzheimer's disease. And probably many of you have a fairly close relative who have experienced it. But it's not just that. I mean, we're all hearing about traumatic brain injury, especially in the NFL, recovering soldiers coming back from the Gulf War. Um, and as I said, schizophrenia, PTSD is a memory disorder. People don't think of it that way, but it's really a memory that can't go away. It's a memory that people are haunted by um, uh, after the traumatic event occurs. And so this is a kind of a different memory disorder where the memory actually doesn't go away. It's a disorder of persistence and it's a disorder of generalization of memories across 
from one context to a completely different context. Um, finally, uh, depression also massively affects memory. Um, but even, you know, if you're a parent, you want to know how your kid's memory is going to develop as they age. I know I was interested in that. I started doing uh, simple tasks that John does with the primates uh, with my baby when she was like one. <laughs> so, she did well. She actually compared to an adult monkey fairly well. <laughs> I'm so glad she's not here to hear this. Um, and aging, which I'll talk a little bit about today, and education, and some of the work we're doing actually has implications for that. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the earliest research on memory, going back to the 1880s, uh, showed very quickly that memories go a lot faster than we think that we do, that, that you think they will. So if you're thinking, I left my car parked in somewhere, you know, in the mall's parking garage two hours ago, well, within about two hours, you're actually going to be only remembering, at best, about half of the information that you've accumulated in that last two hours. This is what you call a forgetting curve. But basically what it means is that uh, after learning, there's already a pretty significant decline at, at about 20 minutes after learning. And within a day, you're basically at the point of losing about two-thirds of those memories during the day. Now, interestingly, it actually stabilizes after two days. And what you have after two days tends to stick around. So there's this kind of early period of drop-off. But then whatever, the little bit that you have does tend to stick. But it does make us wonder what makes these memories different from these memories. And also, what are the brain mechanisms that allow these memories to stick around? Question? Yes. Is that age-related? Uh, that is not age-related, but I'll show you age-related. Uh, you might not want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we'll, we'll show you age-related. This is based on the age of a memory. And actually, this is from one guy, Eppinghaus. See, he studied himself. He's a real masochist. would learn these boring lists of consonant, vowel, consonant trigrams, and then test himself over and over again. So thank God I don't do that. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, ah, oh no, I got these wrong. Okay, yeah, so no, I did, I got it right. Okay, so, uh, these are just two different pictures. This is a, a study of different people at different ages, showing that as people get older, on average, their memory goes down. These are from a longitudinal study, showing that if you look at the same person, you can see these same kinds of effects. But as John eloquently told you today, some people really get hit hard, and others actually do fairly well. I don't know who these people are who are going up over time. I mean, I'll just ask you, how many of you feel like your memories are getting better than you do? Okay, I think, I hope you do, but, uh, um, so, and of course, as John already showed you very nicely, the brain areas that are critical for memory also tend to decline over aging. And we see this in the prefrontal cortex, as John talked about, and in the hippocampus, an area that I'll be talking a lot about. So, it's important to study memory. Um, now, the way we study memory is we look at episodic memory. So, uh, this is, and so when we have an episodic memory, we, the kinds of questions you might be able to answer is something like, okay, who was there? What happened? When did it happen? Where did it happen? And how did it happen? Or something about the people and things, the time, the place, and situation. So, for instance, back in my own life recently, they had a photo shoot for something uh, where they took pictures of me at the lab looking very brainy. Um, this is, but if you had met me fairly recently, this might be the person you remember and you might remember something about this talk. But if you happen to be living in Chicago in the uh, late 90s, you were in the underground music scene, you would have seen a thinner, uh, uh, cooler, maybe a little more hair person um, who uh, was playing at a concert sometime at that point. And so, uh, any questions about that? <laughs> And you still have the CDs. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so we do have an. I do. I have an upcoming uh, album coming. Why is it good? <laughs> Why is it four W plus H? Uh, oh, because I couldn't count what it was. Age-related cognitive impairment. Um, so let's say you're thinking about this show. This was actually a, a gig that we played at a club called Lounge Axe in Chicago. And so when I remember, I don't just remember there was me and a guitar, but there was actually a place that was associated with this event. Time was the 1990s, people were listening to grunge rock, uh, and uh, we played a decent show, it wasn't our best. So 
Um, we can answer all of these questions, but none of these things in and of themselves are the memory. It's the ability to put that all together. Now, a lot of our research, and I don't have time to show you it, but a lot of our research has shown that, in fact, there's a whole stream of brain regions that are processing these separate attributes of the memory. And one of the things we find is, is that each part of the brain has its own kind of filing scheme for memories, where they file them according to who was there versus what happened. And so the perirhinal cortex and the parahippocampal cortex are like the hubs for these brain networks, that are the cognitive brain networks that John talked about. And these areas project to the hippocampus, which is the area you probably heard a lot about in relation to memory. And our framework and all of our evidence shows that what the hippocampus does is a very specific thing. It tells you not just, it links this information about who or what happened with the information about where and when it happened. So if I ever went back to Chicago, I might be able to remember this, being in this context would help me remember I was there, the guitar was there, all the band was there, etc. So, um, but as I said, it's not just about brain regions. And again, John beautifully set this up. It's about brain networks. And so we don't think of these functions as being highly localized. Uh, a way we tend to think about it more is in terms of networks. So each region is connected to each other uh, through the white matter in the brain. We, these are the axons that project through long areas of the brain. And this is a diffusion tensor imaging picture of different brain white matter tracts in a human brain. And uh, actually what we've found is different parts of the medial temporal lobe project through these different networks in different ways. So one way you can think about it is that there's these major freeways for information processing. And some, like Highway 80, some are going to be like Highway 99. And they're coming from different spots. So if you want to get to that central pathway in the hippocampus, you'd have to take one of these two freeways. And we found, in fact, that if you look at regions like the parahippocampal cortex, they project to one network. And regions in the peri perirhinal cortex project to different networks. And our research has shown God, I can't be time okay. um, So our research has shown that, in fact, these two pathways in the brain actually have different functions, and they're affected differently by different disorders. So this has been a major discovery uh, in the field of neurodegenerative disease, as well as in the field of human memory in general. Um, so there's two networks that we've identified throughout all our research. Uh, one of these networks we call the posterior medial system. This is a network of regions. Oh, God, I switched these. Damn it. Okay, so <laughs> this is, yes, I am the absent minded professor. Um, so this network actually corresponds to a white matter pathway called the single and bundle that connects all of these distributed regions of the brain to the hippocampus. Uh, and meanwhile, there's this anterior temporal system that would be actually this connected by this white matter pathway that connects all of these different cognitive regions, including areas of the prefrontal cortex to areas in the medial temporal lobe. Now, why is this important? Well, one of the major discoveries of the past decade has been that neurodegenerative diseases, we tended to think of them before, at least I originally thought of them as your brain is just slowly shriveling and it's bad. But in fact, we're starting to realize that neurodegenerative diseases are not all the same, and they progress along different pathways, just like a serial killer moving along one freeway or something. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to haunt you guys. Um, but so if we look at Alzheimer's disease, hopefully you can see the resemblance between, these are all areas that show high atrophy in kind of early to mid stages of Alzheimer's disease. And this is actually that posterior medial system of areas that are highly functionally connected in a healthy brain. So what you can see is the disease dramatically picks up on that posterior medial pathway. Well, it turns out there's other disorders like semantic dementia. So this is a neurodegenerative disorder that's related to frontotemporal dementia. And it also affects the hippocampus. But unlike Alzheimer's, which affects that episodic memory I've been talking about, semantic dementia actually affects your memory for facts or general knowledge about different objects or people in our world. And that progresses along this anterior temporal network. And in fact, what people have argued is, is that in Alzheimer's, it's not just the hippocampal damage that causes these severe memory deficits, but it's this cortical damage and this disconnection within a cortical network that John already told you so beautifully about. So we've already begun translating some of these ideas by looking at different brain networks. And so um, a lot of people, as you know, are worried about Alzheimer's disease, but John mentioned uh, diabetes as one major factor. And it's 
Diabetes is a major time bomb. If there's one thing I can tell you is don't get diabetes, please. Um, if you look at most, many people, if you look at older subjects' brains, in particular, I used to be at a VA hospital, almost every patient we would see in the VA hospital would look like this. This is what you call a flare scan. And what it does is it shows you damage in the white matter that are related to little tiny disruptions in the vasculature that cause essentially cell death, uh, death or breakage of the white matter, so to speak. I'm not explaining it right, but hopefully you can fill in the gaps. And what you can see is these white matter deficits tend to occur around the ventricles, but these are actually major pathways that connect major parts of the brain. And in particular, they're, they're connecting the prefrontal cortex with all of these areas of the brain that are critical for providing the memories that the prefrontal cortex can work with. And what we found is people with more damage to white matter pathways near the prefrontal cortex showed a dramatic reduction in both long-term memory and working memory performance and in the ability to recruit prefrontal cortex during these tasks. And so, yes? Could you explain a little more about what white matter actually is? Yeah, so um, in uh, Dr. Morrison's talk, he talked about axons and dendrites. So the axons are essentially communicating information from one cell to another. And the white matter is uh, essentially a big bundle of axons. They're white because they're covered in myelin, which is sort of fatty. And so sort of like you look at bacon or something, it like, looks really white because there's so much fat on it. And so that's why the white matter looks like. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so what we see is damage to these white matter pathways both impairs memory performance and it impairs your ability to recruit the prefrontal cortex. So even if people whose frontal cortex might look fine, their ability to use anything that's coming from other parts of the brain is dramatically compromised. And this is important because people who have these uh, white matter deficits are very different from your typical Alzheimer's profile. My grandfather actually died from uh, vascular dementia, so this is kind of personal to me, actually. Um, and uh, one of the things is, is that this is largely, there are things you can do about this. This is related to reduce, you know, eliminating hypertension, avoiding diabetes, or treating diabetes if you have it. There are all of these things you can do. And in fact, there's much more you can do about this kind of death, these kind of deficits than you can about Alzheimer's right now. So as I mentioned, we're also doing some work on schizophrenia. This is in collaboration with Cam Carter and Dan Ragland, who's been really our uh, primary leader in this research. And what we, did, what we do is we take our basic science results where we study young and healthy people and we come up with tasks that we can use to measure memory in these people that are sensitive to individual differences in memory. And what we realize is, is that if you actually bang your head and go to the hospital and get tested by a neuropsychologist, the tests they'll give you are about 50 to 80 years old. I mean, these are not tests that were designed with our current understanding of the brain. So what Cam started was this initiative to say, hey, let's take uh, methods that we've used for measuring activity based on neuroscience and use that in the clinic. And so through the Centrax initiative, Dan and I came up with a task that was a straight adaptation of what we had done in fMRI studies. And we've run this now in a multi-site clinical trial where we can use these measures essentially it's to test whether we can use these measures to develop improved drugs for schizophrenia. And what we find is these measures are much more sensitive to deficits in memory and specific deficits in memory for that association between who and what and where, when, and how, which is the critical part of episodic memory. And so we're building on this research, both in terms of ways to develop rehabilitation methods and uh, develop uh, and uh, restore prefrontal functioning. And so Dan and I have an NIH grant to look at this, and we've also, through the set UC Davis Center for Excellence in Behavioral <coughs> Health, or something, it's Behavioral Health Excellence? That's good. Okay. <laughs> uh, you guys need a better acronym. That's the thing. Uh, we actually have another grant to try an experimental approach, which I'll tell you about. Um, so, can we enhance memory? Um, I like to collect products that actually try to make these claims of really kind of fun. This is an Indian cocoa drink that I bought when I was in India. Um, I just found this, but if you've seen the movie Limitless, this is what it's referring to. Um, I just love neurogasms. <laughs> so offensive. It's, so it's offensive to me as a neuroscientist. So much more. Um, so just very quickly, um, you know, I know many of you probably will have the question, will blah, blah, blah improve my memory? 
If somebody's trying to sell it to you, probably not. <laughs> uh, uh, these are kind of uh, um, interventions that people are using. Um, right now, the evidence is they don't necessarily work any better than a placebo, but then again, placebo effects are real, so if you take it, believe in it, and actually that might help you. Uh, there's some evidence for blueberry supplementation improving uh, function and aging. I think John probably can tell you way more about this stuff. Uh, brain games, puzzles, action video games have been linked to certain kinds of improvements in cognition. It's not clear how big those effects are or how much they generalize to all kinds of memory tests, but there is some evidence to suggest they work. Um, the most promising evidence is the stuff that you won't do, and I know I don't do, <laughs> which is uh, um, get aerobic exercise, sleep really well. Uh, actually, I do have some motivation to learn. All of these things are really good ways of improving your memory. And the things to avoid are all the things that I am um, at risk for. I've got family history of diabetes and hypertension. I'm always under chronic stress. So um, these are the things that are very bad for your brain and bad for your memory in particular. Um, we're trying some new directions to try to see whether there's different ways in which we can help people improve their memories. And so I'll talk about that in the next whatever minutes that I have. Um, so um, one approach we're using is harnessing the power of brain oscillation. So if you actually, if your brain was like, Okay, this is going to be a bad analogy, so I'm going to use it. I'll say if you record, if you just hook up electrodes to your uh, scalp, what you'll see is that actually it doesn't just look like white noise, but it actually has a frequency structure to it. So you'll tend to see these kind of uh, waves in the brain, and that's why we call them brain waves. Well, these are what technically people would call neural oscillations because the potentials oscillate from positive to negative over time. And there's different frequencies of oscillation. So as it turns out, the theta frequency is fascinating. It's a frequency that's been linked to memory for a long time because you can record it directly from the Radcliffe campus. And this is a raw trace of local field potentials from the Radcliffe campus. Now, we see this actually in human EEG as well, even on scalp. You can see here's some bursts of theta activity during just resting EEG performance. In our work, we've shown that EEG activity in the theta band is actually predictive both of effective memory binding at the individual level, but also across subjects. So that people who show more theta activity during remembering actually show a better ability to remember what happened and what context it happened in. Um, and so we've got a grant to study this morning. I'll tell you a little bit about some of this research. So one of our crazy, uh, we call this the shadow lab whenever we run a crazy study that will never work. We, people don't tell me about it until after it's done. <laughs> Not quite true, but somewhat true. Um, so my postdoc, Brooke, bought these, this uh, device to uh, rhythmically stimulate people with visual and auditory stimuli at the theta band. As it turned out, doing this between learning and remembering actually enhanced the brain's ability to generate spontaneous theta activity during remembering. We can see this over frontal and parietal areas of the scalp. But we can also see that it improved memory performance in two different experiments. Uh, these are modest effects, but considering that people just essentially tripped out for about 20 minutes on this rhythmic audio and visual stimuli, it's not too bad. Um, we're trying some other approaches which are less crazy, uh, but one approach is to use small electrical currents on the scalp. There's actually um, gamers are really big on this, so maybe if you have a, a son who's in high school or college, he might have bought some device like to do this on the internet. Uh, tell him not to do it. <laughs> uh, we're still trying to figure out whether electrical stimulation on the surface can enhance brain activity. So we've actually taken people's MRIs, we're using them to model exactly where you need to put the electrodes in order to target specific uh, brain areas. And actually, our partner in that, Mike Russell, is somewhere back in the audience. Um, and what we've gotten already is that we've shown that by stimulating the prefrontal cortex, we can enhance theta activity during learning. And by enhancing theta activity during learning, and so this is people who actually were learning this associative information about, again, item and context information, versus people who, versus conditions where you're just learning about items alone. And in sham conditions, we see nothing with stimulation. We see a big theta enhancement during learning. And that theta enhancement is related to tiny effect, but it's, it's uh, there of an enhancement in memory 
for the kinds of associations I've been telling you about. Now, this is again a small effect, but we can do a lot of things to improve it. So we're exploring a lot of that right now. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about motivation, because this is a factor that people often don't talk about in memory. But actually, motivation plays a huge part. One of the things we've learned about memory is that for any memory to stabilize, for those synaptic changes that John talked about to stabilize, you need the presence of some kind of neuromodulator. And these neuromodulators are actually um, released by the brain during times that are particularly important, during you know, reward or during feeding or during hunger, um, uh, all kinds of stuff. And so dopamine is one of these neuromodulators that, and that's released during uh, reward. But it's actually related to motivating you and energizing you to get reward. So it's more about the wanting than the actual experience of reward. Okay. Um, so let me just get to this one and I'll skip the rest. This is Matthias Gruber, my postdoc, is doing a TEDx talk you can see on the net. Um, if you've heard about me, uh, our work, it might have been through this study which generated a lot of media attention. And this was a study in which we looked at the role of curiosity in learning. Um, now, a lot of people have done work showing that monetary rewards or things of that nature can facilitate learning, but we wanted to look at what motivates you to learn in the real life. And so, in real life, people have a motivation to learn because they know some, something about something. So, for instance, if you know a lot about baseball and all of a sudden somebody says, hey, do you know this and ask you a baseball trivia question and you don't know it, you'd probably be really highly motivated to find out that. And so, this is exactly the kind of task that we harnessed in our experiment, where we gave people a lot of different kinds of trivia questions, and we just asked them how curious they were to know the answer to these questions if they didn't know it. We picked out those questions that we then said, for some questions would be ones that people were highly curious about the outcome. Other questions were ones that they didn't really care about learning. And during the scanning phase, we would make them wait. We would keep them in suspense after showing them the question, and then we would show them the answer. And so what I'm going to show you is activity that happens here. Not when they actually get the answer, but when they're motivated to learn the answer. And so this is before they're actually even learning, but they're in a state to want to learn. And during that state, we actually showed them a picture of a face, which they don't even care about. But this is going to be critical to the message that we got from the study. So, uh, where are I? Ah, okay. So what we found, first of all, is when people are curious, they're actually better at, at remembering the answers to the questions that we gave them. Not surprising, if you're curious, hopefully you want to know more. What is surprising is, when you see a face in that state of curiosity, you don't even care about the face. In fact, that face is an impediment to your getting the answer. Just being in that state of curiosity sucks in a memory for this face, so that you get better face memory if you're in a state of curiosity than when you're not. So the whole state of being curious can suck in even things you're not interested in. And this is something that teachers harness all the time. What we then did is we said, okay, let's look at what happens when we ask the question, we stimulate people's curiosity. Well, in the dopaminergic midbrain, what we see is the more curious people are, the more activation we see in this area. So again, we're seeing some evidence consistent with some dopaminergic activity taking place. What we also see is that, again, during the question, they're not even getting the answer. The hippocampus is already at work when people are curious, and the amount of work the hippocampus is doing predicts whether or not you'll learn that information. But it's only if you're in that curious state. If not, Whatever the hippocampus is doing when you get the answer is going to be predictive of memory. So um, this is just showing that we ask people also to remember this incidental information, like the face. And what we found is the degree to which people were curious, and they had curiosity-related brain activity, predicted how much curiosity helped their learning. We see this both for the dopaminergic midbrain and for the hippocampus. Um, so I realize I'm probably out of time. I'm just going to very quickly say we've got some new directions. We're partnering with a, uh, with a Bay Area startup to look at the effects of wearable cameras and see if we can use that. This is a picture from one of those cameras uh, along the psychological principles to improve memory. Um, we're improving brain training techniques. And I just want to say you can stay connected with us by checking out our website. Uh, we've also set up a larger group here called the Memory and Plasticity Group, and you can access this site for that information. You can also look us up on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>